Hi everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. Kurt Rosenwinkel is probably one of the most influential jazz musicians of the last 20 years. His impact on the scene both as a jazz guitar player and also as a band leader and a composer is huge. In this video I'm going to take a look at some phrases from his solo on the song Nefertiti, uh, which is off the Mark Turner album Ballad Session. Uh, Kurt worked really a lot with Mark Turner both in Mark Turner's band and also in, in uh, the Rosenmittel's various quartets and quintets and I think they influenced each other quite a lot and I think also any collaboration with those two is definitely worthwhile checking out. One of the things I find most interesting about Kurt Rosenwinkel is his melodic language. I think he has a very unique and strong way of making melody. In this video I'm going to try to discuss that part of it with uh, analyzing the licks and I'm also going to relate it to some of the things he talked about in terms of exercises and the way he's thinking about things that I heard from him when I was attending some master classes while I was studying. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo, check out some interesting arpeggios or chord voicings, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. The solo is on Nefertiti, which is a Wayne Shorter composition, and you probably already know it from uh, from the second Miles Quintet where he's playing it with, uh, so with Miles and Hancock, Ron Carter and Tony Williams. At least that's the famous recording of this song. The tricky thing about uh, Wayne Shorter compositions is that the chords are maybe not really connected. They have like strong melodies and beautiful harmonies, but the chords don't really move in the way that we're used to if you're just used to playing standards where everything is functional. So it's really about different sounds next to each other uh, and exploring how to make melodies on that, which can be a little bit tricky. The first thing that's immediately clear from this example is that it has a quite large range. So he starts on this low D and then it actually goes up to this high F uh, in the next bar already. So in a relatively short amount of time, uh, there's really a lot of uh, the range of the instrument being used which is something that's very typical for Rosenwinkel's playing, I think. Uh, so the first chord is sort of an A sus sound, and uh, what he's playing on it is really just, well, basically, you would expect this to be associated with a D major scale, and uh, he's just playing that D major scale without the G, so. And then the chord changes to this uh, D7 altered with a B flat in the bass. And here he goes up to the F and then up to F sharp and skips up to B flat and then plays a scale run here and then adds a chord. So, and this is just a fairly basic uh, D7 altered using a B flat major triad as an upper structure. And then up to the F and using that to transition to the next chord by just moving down in half steps to the D sharp on the on the F sharp sub four. What is really typical for Rosenwinkel here is one sort of the large range, which is really something that he makes use of a lot. You'll see that in most of the examples that I'm going to cover here. And uh, another thing is that he uh, he really talks about practicing having a melodic idea and then uh, having the freedom and the ability to move that across changes without being bothered by that the scales or the chords are changing. And I think this is a really good example of that. The basic melodic idea in the beginning is more or less an ascending melodic idea or an ascending scale run. Uh, and even though it's not completely like a, a stepwise scale run all the way. So he starts with, with uh, this fairly easy sort of D scale run on the, on the ASOS 4 and then just continues the same movement on the next chord which is the D7 over B flat. So the idea is here that we have an ascending scale run and it becomes free of the changes. It doesn't have to uh, change direction when the chords are changing. He can keep the melodic idea going across the bar line. And in the masterclass that I attended, he talked about working on this from quite a few um, approaches. So, but the, I think the main approach is really just to practice the never ending scale exercise, which is to take a uh, chord progression with different, usually with different scales in it that's a little bit uh, more practical and then try to take, uh, to keep on playing the scale 
as if the progression is in time. So you will play, for instance, eight notes through a turnaround with all the dominants, and then um, change scale whenever you've played above eight notes. And in that way, working on thinking ahead and uh, changing scales and keeping that movement going. And of course, you can do the same also with structures from uh, from the scales. So you can do that with diatonic triads or uh, diatonic seventh chords. This example is at the end of the first chorus and uh, the harmony that uh, they seem to be using in the solo here are a little bit different than what I normally know for Nefertiti because uh, we get first the E sus4 and then we get an E flat7 sharp11 and then uh, normally I would actually go to some sort of B flat to E flat but here they seem to be playing just A7 altered for two bars taking us back to the A flat major 7 so in that way it is kind of more of a functional uh, progression here so we really get from Wayne Short already like a, a 5-1 type resolution going back to the top of the, the form. The first part of the line is again sort of this idea about letting the melody rule uh, and letting the direction of the melody decide what's going on, kind of ignoring other factors in, in the music. So uh, the first part is on the E7 source 4 and uh, that's just really a pickup so going down to the A here so the sharp 11 on the E flat 7. Uh, it's also worth noticing that if you check out the whole solo then Kurt is really emphasizing the sharp 11 on this E flat 7 pretty much throughout the solo uh, and here is no exception so going down to the A and then we get the first part of the phrase which is really just a long run from this A and then again a large range up to the high F so from A and then up and playing um, a D flat major 7 sharp 5 arpeggio with a leading note here, C, so C and then up the arpeggio. And I think normally when you have a, a line like this uh, in sort of more bop oriented uh, solos, you're actually going to have sort of a, a fast movement in one direction is going to be resolved with a scale wise movement in the other direction. But that's not what's happening here because what's important is the direction of the melody. So um, Rosenwinkel is continuing up the scale from D flat up to F. So we get. And then ending the line by this leap down a fifth to the B flat. So we have this happening. Uh, so, so that's definitely something that I think where you can kind of tell that it's important what direction the melody has and that's more important than, than sort of the, the counterpoint rules that we have for melody, once in a while at least. And then the next part of the line is on the sort of two bars of A7 altered. Uh, it starts as a pickup with a scale run, so... From there, moving up to... Now I'm going to call it a C sharp because it's an A7 altered. Uh, so C sharp and then down the augmented triad, and then a G and then skips up to the C to play a descending uh, D-flat or C-sharp, major 7-sharp 5 arpeggio again. And then from here, moving uh, up to the G again. And then an ascending B-flat major triad. And then a descending uh, A diminished triad, resolving to the resolving that kind of to the B flat. Again, this is probably maybe resolving because I can't tend to hear this as being like a B flat melodic minor uh, line, which is what where this material is coming from. And then the C sharp on the one of the next part. So what we have here is that we have a line that if you look at the whole line, it's moving down. So it's moving from this C and then down to the to the B flat. So again, fairly large range, but it's not a straight line this time. It's really, um, most of the time when you have li lines like this, you will find that they're a lot more predictable. This is a lot less predictable than, than what you normally will come across because a movement like this will, will kind of happen in, uh, in some sort of sequence or another more predictable uh, way. But here it's really just different arpeggios 
tied together. Like this. And I think that's also something that's very typical for, for uh, Rosenberg's playing, that uh, you have these lines that will have a lot of different directions and intervals within them, but still sound quite coherent and you'll still uh, make them, without really sounding like a sequence, make them interesting and also almost like vocal-like compared to what you normally hear if you're listening to more uh, Bob-oriented material. <laughs> As you saw in the previous example, Rosenwinkel is using a lot of diatonic triads in uh, his playing. So uh, you had the descending D flat uh, augmented triad and also the B flat minor and the A diminished triad in, in the last part of that line. And that's also what's happening here. We have E major 7, it's kind of like an E major 7 with a sharp 11. And the first part of the line is an E major triad, so really just the basic E major triad, second inversion and starting on the low B here. From there, moving up to a C sharp minor triad, and then up to the sharp 11, to the A sharp, and then just continuing up what you could, could even consider sort of a pentatonic fragment, but at least, so A sharp, C sharp, D, so that we have the, the major seven really being emphasized here at the end of the line. So again, we have a line with a large range, moving fast all the way from the low B up to the D sharp and uh, from here going down to the C sharp and then skipping up to the F sharp to approach the next chord and the idea with the F sharp is just to move down in half steps to the fifth of A which is of course the next chord. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that I have a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting my channel. I'm very grateful for that. And if you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. If you join us over on Patreon, I can also give you something in return for your support. The first examples were really focused on how he's constructing the lines and the material that he's using and also um, really talking about more dense eight note lines. But another thing that you'll also find that he's using quite a lot is motifs. And uh, this is an example of that. And it's really a nice example of how to be fairly creative and still have a really strong idea of a motif that's being worked with without being too obvious. Because I think also sometimes you'll find that when people are using motifs, it gets a little bit on the obvious side. Um, so at least to, me, to my taste. Uh, this is his first on the B flat minor 7 and uh, the first part is really just an F minor 7 arpeggio so it's it's really just a, a short melody only using those notes that's another thing that's also quite typical uh, for, for Kurt Rosenberg's playing is that he will stick with kind of a, a small pool of notes and then make a short melody with that and not immediately start mixing up all the different sounds and use the entire scale, uh, which is, I guess, a little bit uncommon for jazz. So we have that part, then moving this motif. I think the, the main idea here is that we have really just a range here, and then we have a descending arpeggio. And then on the next chord, which is an A major seven sharp 11, we're gonna get the fifth interval, and then a descending arpeggio, which is then an A major 7 flat 5 arpeggio. And then on the E flat 7, which is a Lydian dominant, again, the, the Lydian, so the, the sharp 11 sound is really emphasized here. And here you can also really easily see that this was the A major 7, the beginning of that motif, and here we get just a development on that on the E flat 7. And then a descending augmented triad down to the A, so again, really emphasizing the, the sharp 11 on the linear dominant. If you want to check out one of the guitar players that really influenced Kurt Rosenwinkel, 
then you should check out this video where I'm analyzing some phrases from an Alan Holdsworth solo. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar and it's the first time you see one of my videos, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this time. Thank you for watching and until next time.